Talk to me. Hey guys, welcome back to Pop Culture with Pat. So I am so excited to be joined by today's guest. Today I am joined by some of the great team from A24 is Talk to Me. Today I am talking to makeup artist Beck Brado. I'm also talking to prosthetic artist Nick Nicolau and Paul Katie. Thank you guys for coming on the show today. So excited to have you on. Thanks for having us. Thank you. <laughs> of course, of course. So we'll uh, we'll go ahead to to kind of start things off. You know, just from the beginning, I wanted to ask. You know, you guys, and we'll start off with you, Beck, and just kind of you know go in order. Um, what when you were first brought on to talk to me? What were some of those initial discussions as far as just like laying things out for the film with with Rocco Rocco with what they were kind of looking for with some of the the looks and designs? Um, I think for hair and makeup world, it was, um, I mean, for me, it was the possession scenes were a lot more important. Danny had done a lot of research on um, people that have been possessed, so it was it was just getting that right, really. Um, and then, uh, I guess just creating a realistic look for all of our casts, something that people can, um, relate to as well. What about, uh, we'll go with you, Nick. Um, well, just on, on Beck's part, I, I think the most difficult thing and, and, we had difficulty getting our head around it with the contact lenses. They seem to be the, the most elaborate and most layered part of the effects. There was, yeah, so many um, examples and we just said, Beck, please look after it and Beck was on top of it. But the, the contact lenses seemed to be... You mean know, the, the, the choice. Yeah, the choice, yeah. the layering, the intensity of them. That seemed to be the most difficult. Everything else, we kind of bounced off each other and, um, yeah, the prosthetics kind of ha had their own little world, but then we crossed over to, to Beck's world. But the lenses were always yeah. one of the most important aspects uh, to Danny and Michael. Yeah. And and I guess just making that work with the, the makeup on the face so it didn't look, you know, over the top and hokey and sort of, going into zombie world, sort of subtle, but uh, have enough there that it, it gave you that sort of possession look. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I love the look of the the contact lenses too. I mean, they, each of the characters were, were creepy as hell. Uh, and I love that you guys went with the, the contact lenses. I, I believe there was, was there a little bit of like CGI kind of like blended in when, when the eyes were like expanding? I, I thought I heard like an, another yeah. Thing. So that with the possessions, um, there was there's like three stages of possession. So we went from I think it's seventeen mil, seventeen to eight or now I have to remember the <laughs> the dimensions. Anyway, there was like the size of your um, iris, and then a little bit bigger, and then the real big twenty two mil ones. Um, so yeah, there is that one scene where Sophie's possessed, the, oh, sorry, Mia's possessed the first time um, and you can see the CGI just kind of just very s slowly um, make them bigger. So, yeah, there is, yeah, there is a little bit of CG there. <laughs> we were talking about that before, you know, we kind of jumped on back is just that that there I think is like a good example of blending uh, CGI and using, you know, practical things like like contacts and kind of blending those together and, and how they can look great. But as far as just in general, I, I love when horror goes the the practical route rather than using CIG, CGI, because a lot, a lot of cases, for me at least, it just seems so much real. And, and sometimes when you see CGI in a film, it can, especially if it's not you know necessarily done that great, it can take you out of the film. Um, because you don't, you just don't feel like you're kind of you know there with with the characters. Yeah, I, I think it's good to do. I mean, like everyone says, do as much as you can in camera, and then if you need to, you know, augment or do a little tweak. I mean, that's what digital is really good for. Yeah. Um, uh, but I think most of our stuff was pretty in, done in camera. I don't think they, except Beck's example. But I think maybe on the eye poke, they did a bit of a a morph on the pupil to get it a bit squishy looking 
when he was, yeah, that, yeah, right. Which everyone horrified in the cinema. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, other than that, it was you know they didn't really, um, you know, have to do much, and I think it, it adds to the, you know, effectiveness of the effects. You know, like when he's smashing his head and he's bleeding and. Oh yeah. And what you're saying, what you're saying, Pat, about trying to do everything in camera with a slight manipulation with VFX is always our approach. And and Danny and Michael are hundred percent on board with that. Um, da- uh, Michael called me the other night for a new film that um, they're going to get up, and he was trying to figure out an effect, and he was questioning me, and I mentioned CGI just for a brief moment, and um, he goes, "No, no, no CGI." <laughs> so, um, he's totally on board with that um, I- ideology. I, I think it, that's their fault deal. sometimes. I think. <laughs> yeah, I think the great thing about digital now is that if if we do a do a prosthetic and in camera and um, you know the character, you know the prosthetic could be you know old, as in it's been on on the actor for like ten hours. It's starting to wear. And then they'll go in for a close up, and and then they can, if there's a bit of an edge or a bit of a mm-hmm. wearing around the mouth, they can just go in and retouch it. Yeah. Um, and then they don't have to sort of abandon the, you know, close up at the end of the day, or you know, might catch a bit of light weirdly or wrinkle a bit weirdly, um, and they can just go in and retouch. It. You know, it's usually you know a couple of frames. I mean, that's a good blend of both, both techniques. Yeah, but I was gonna say it definitely can see you guys sometimes or sometimes. Yeah, <laughs> To do it in camera and especially, you know, bleeding and stuff like that, you just get all those happy accidents. Um, mm. Like when he smashed his head for the first time and he sort of looked up to the camera and all the blood. You know, we didn't know how that was all going to, you know, we had an idea, but the way the blood fell down his face was, you know, the the random, the, random, the happy accidents. Yep. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Those are always the best for sure. And, so, you know, and we were kind of, you know, touching on this a little bit already. So a number of the kids, you know, they end up getting possessed. They start playing this game. They all grab the hand. And when they initially get possessed, um, what was your approach for those initial scenes? You know, not necessarily like we'll, we'll get into like Riley and stuff, you know, a little bit. Um, but just those initial scenes where we see, you know, the contact lenses, we see there's uh, kind of like the darkening around the eyes, darkening around like the mouse. Um, what was kind of your approach for each one of those? They they kind of had a similar look for each one, but how did you make each one of those stand out as well? Um, so that that the inspiration for that makeup kind of comes from a real a real possession, if you believe in it. Um, there was a there's a woman that um, we watched a video of, and her like I think it's like it's the veins that pop out and the capillaries from that stress on your face for like not breathing. Um, so it, it comes from that, but I guess a little bit more theatrical, a bit more. Um, wanted to make a bit more of a point with that, I suppose. And the contact lenses is a Danny and Michael thing that they're, they're very particular about what they want. So. Um, uh the possession is um there's three stages of the makeup but um there's two stages of possession i suppose so there's the um talk to me which is normal they just see something but then when they let them in it goes up to the 90 seconds and then it has to end so um it starts with the just the dilated pupil and then it the um eyes expand expand and the makeup gets worse and worse so they they're let in continuously if that makes sense um and uh we did we did want to make them all like slightly different like they they're all getting possessed in different ways um so yeah the makeup i mean we just did different artists did each person so it's naturally going to be a little bit different um but also that montage scene was one of the hardest days on set, I think, because we had 50 shots to do in about, I don't know, half a day, and they just went full racka racka. <laughs> <laughs> um, Daddy and Michael took over and 
Um, it was insane to say the least. So we had about five minutes to do each makeup and poking people in the eyes and yeah, it was it was nuts, but it turned out really well. That is insane. And and, and what about for for you guys? Well, when we went into like the mom, like most of ours went into prosthetic world because we wanted, um, I guess that sculptural um, element and to make it a bit more elaborate, like the the drowning woman and the um, the mum, you know, all, she, they're all wearing prosthetics, silicon prosthetics, and their look is very, um, what's the term? They're, lots of purples and greens and very um, um, puffed, a lot of puff, you know, puffed up eyes and, and yeah. just trying to augment their face so they looked... Um, Possessed, I guess. <laughs> Again, uh, Dan Danny and Michael. Initially, we had um, a lot of, a lot more elaborate designs, mo a lot more fantastical ideas, and they pulled it right back. They wanted it to look quite real. They wanted it to look deformed and unusual and weird, but they didn't want to go into monster creature realm. Yeah. They wanted it to look like people that just had a deformity. So. Our prosthetics slowly started um, twisting and deforming the face, and uh, and then we got more elaborate as uh, the more the main characters and the main um, demons came into the mix. So, and we probably went into forensic world, and you know, like drown, you know, reference of drowned people, and and so it was quite realistic. Um, as Nick was saying, it, it wasn't creaturey. It was more forensic and medical and um, natural. It is um, interesting to hear you guys say, though, that initially you were kind of had some designs that were going to be a little bit more supernatural kind of like feel to them. And you kind of hold back a little bit. I mean, those are the, like the little things that I love to hear kind of behind the scenes stuff where you started off with one initial design and then it ended up going in a uh, different direction. So, yeah, there. especially if you you watch their um, their YouTube channel and you go, oh, these guys are crazy. They're going to love. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> They're going to love all this stuff. And then, but they pulled it, you know, quite contained, quite um, mm. realistic and natural, I guess. I, the, I think that's why the, the film it works so well. The, yeah. Those sequences are quite unnerving and cringeworthy because everyone's going through a, quite a realistic um um, transformation yeah, yeah transformation and uh, um accident like they're, they're bleeding they're smashing their heads they're, no one's so over the top where you you don't think it could happen to you so yeah and and it doesn't take you out of the this the realism of the scene and the situation like if if people started turning into you know the beast within or you know went all creaturey and all the how you know you want to go oh, it'll just take you out of the movie yeah mm -hmm. yeah no I think the grounded approach definitely worked and yeah, definitely there was, there was a number of scenes that made me cringe, you know, quite a bit. So you guys did a great job, you know, as far as that goes. And speaking of, you know, kind of, of, of smashing heads. So we'll, we'll get into the bit with, uh, with Riley. So being the focus of the spirits, Riley goes through hell literally throughout the film. Uh, can you break down the different stages of Riley as the film, you know, kind of goes on again, back started. <laughs> Beck always started the process and um, <laughs> and the guys had a, a really clear idea of when we should jump in, when the next level should be. So, yeah. Um, no, we had now I jog my memory. <laughs> what was that, sorry? Nothing. We had like three or four sculpts for Riley's wounds from when he smashed his head and he had the initial splits and cuts and then... Mm. You know, he went into swelling and healing when he's in the hospital. Mm. Um, so probably, like, obviously he's, when he starts smashing, he's splitting his, you know, they're quite fresh wounds. So he's he's got cuts. He's got that big forehead cut where, which bleeds down his face. But then as he starts to heal, those, you know, close up and swell a bit and we did the, the more, um, you know, the bruising and the, the stuff where he's sort of, but we we also made it a bit 
um, well, so I'm not going to say heavier, but we we did go a little bit fantastical in that, and and made it happen because of what we we knew we were dealing with a little bit of a spirit, you know, possession possessiony thing. Mm-hmm. We thought, well, we could cheat, and you know, maybe he does brew, go because obviously when you bruise, you, you know, it happens in different stages in terms of the colouring, but we sort of accelerated it a bit just for dramatic effect so that when he's in the hospital the next day or after the it all happens he's really messed up like he's just gone you know he looks like he's gone 10 rounds in mike tyson sort of thing and again, da- danny and michael knew the, and they changed it they changed it up we had to um be a bit flexible where we were put in the prosthetics but they knew riley was gonna start off by smashing his head on the table was going to go across the room do this, get, get a wound on his head, bruise it, go, poke his eye out, swelling on the eye. So we had to create all those prosthetics individually and then start applying them gradually as the sequence yeah. went on. So. And I think we might have done a tag, like when we were putting, for example, Riley's eye on, I think Beck was doing a, they were shooting it, it might have even been shooting Sophie or something, like so that... Yeah. They weren't waiting for us, so we sort of were. Um, they had stuff to shoot while we were getting Riley ready for the, and then we'd come back with Riley, and he'd smash his head and pump blood out, and then we'd do the eye gag, which is the under B roll of him sticking his eye in the in his, uh, finger in his eye. Oh, I can imagine the application for for both the makeup and the prosthetics for specifically Riley alone, because I mean. Just God, the the injury to him specifically when that scene happened, I had went to go see the film opening night with my buddy. And I don't know if it's just it's if it was because like the face specifically, but you know, smashing your head and just seeing like those injuries, and then he goes to grab his eye. I'm usually like pretty good when it comes to you know gore and stuff like that with horror movies, but I don't know. I, I think kind of what you guys were saying before, I think just kind of that realistic approach and just letting things kind of happen and having those some of those happy accidents. It just it was really effective. And, and I was like it even I've seen the film a couple times now, and it's just as effective seeing it the second, yeah. the third time that, that it was the first time seeing the movie. I've, I've seen it the- three times and I've squirmed and I was there when it was applied and I still squirm <laughs> and I love gore, but I, I'm in the cinema going, oh, this is too much. <laughs> 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 at, at the screening that at the at the Ramwick Ritz in Sydney, um, where everyone, the crew and public screening, yeah, people were literally doing that. But I think the key to that scene is the, you know, he's starting to talk as um, Rhea, uh, me as the, a mother, the mum, and yeah. he's all yeah. sweet and everything, and it's all, you know, and it, and the whole audience is just sucked in, going, oh, this is well, what a beautiful moment, and then he just goes smash. Yeah. And that's what freaks people out. It's the timing and that editing and that little build up they do, which obviously when we're shooting, you know, they've got in their head how they're going to cut it. Um, and and that's another key to our to making our work work is um, is the editing, mm. uh, of course, and the lighting. You know, you need a good DP knows how to sh- shoot our work to a not only make it look real but also, you know, hide hide. You know, you know, if we've got tubes coming down the back of his head and, you know, and they set up a camera behind the head and we're going, what are you doing, you know? Um, so so it, it is. It's a real c- collaboration to make our work, um, you know, effective, effective and, and work in the context of the scene they're trying to do. Oh, yeah, it definitely, definitely takes a team, you know, uh, to, to make everything work. And the, one of the other scenes with Riley, too, I think uh, when they are – they bring him back home initially and they have him like in the, the shower, the bath and uh, trying yeah. to like, you know, clean them all down. And then he, he falls down and he starts like, you know, he's on there and he starts smashing his head into the wall again and starts licking the blood again. Yeah. It's just like, Oh my God, like <laughs> what is going on here? So, I mean, you, you guys, you know, fantastic job all around. Um, you know, as far as it goes, you should mention that because we were, not that he wasn't. We basically put all the blood tubing behind him and rigged the wall behind him to bleed. 
that's where the blood was coming from because I don't, I don't, did it, we not have time or? No, that, again, we, he was going to bash his head against the tiles and the tiles were going to break. So we were just in the back of it, back of the set and we had blood tube in a little hole in the wall. And the, as soon as his head impacted the wall, the, the, the wall was tube. bleeding you know, behind him and then it just ran with the water down into the drain. It was yeah. just perfect. Yeah. So sometimes was, you don't, I guess my point is sometimes you, you don't have to rig the actor with the the bleeding. You can rig the the the, the weapon or the um the wall the wall or whatever he's, he's smashing against. So again, it, it's, it's 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 all an illusion. It's, it's all trick of the eye, I guess. That was a whole. Did it take us a whole day to shoot that? I remember that being quite an ordeal. That whole scene. Yeah, because remember the. They they had that bit of um, bit of tile or something in front of his face, oh. and, and they did all these takes, and they went, "Oh, hang on!" So we had to they had to get rid of that. It, it, yeah. it, didn't, it didn't it didn't take us a day to do the effects. It, no, it was, it was lead it, up to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but also, this I just remember there's certain scenes where Daddy and Michael were just like, "This has to be right." Yeah. Like some scenes they were like they'd rush it and they'd be like, yeah, we've got it, it's fine. But some scenes it was like this needs to be perfect. I remember that one being a bit like that. That makes so, sense though. I mean, they're important important scenes, so you definitely want to make sure that yeah. you, you know you nail it. And and I think yeah, you know, did. And uh, Joe does it so well, so yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Really well. <laughs> yeah. Have we been in this industry? Uh, a long time and and just being in that audience for the screening it was it was a first for me um and really satisfying and gratifying that all our all our effects were really driving the sequence and were really impactful really made people squirm we we put a lot of time and, and production to put a lot of money into doing effects on other films where you cut someone's throat and it's like four weeks of work and it's on screen for a second and you get a little cringe from people. But, again, for me, the, and I know it felt for Paul and everyone around us that it made a big difference and yeah. it was just such a satisfying moment to, to be in that um, audience. And it helped drive the plot too. But we, I remember, yeah, watching the audience thinking, oh, well, it's taken us about 35 years. I mean, the last time we had a really good, screening was when we did the matrix <laughs> in terms of i mean obviously we've done other cool stuff in between but in terms of working on a project and going well this is going to be good uh because most of the time you do stuff and it's you know it's on the cinema if it gets to the cinema yep uh you know for a week and yeah but be, being a this you know an australian horror film um and the way it's been received i mean yeah it's it's great Oh, yeah, this for me, this is definitely like there's probably in the past like 10, 15 years. This is one of those films and for a debut as well. It, it's going to be up there with films for me personally, at least with like It Follows, The Witch, The Babadook, some of those great modern horror films that we've gotten in the past like several years. Talk to me is up there for for this year. Uh, it's the scariest movie of 2023 that I've seen uh, so far. And like you said, I think. It must be really satisfying to have, you know, all of your guys' work play such an important part, you know, in the film and audiences really get to, you know, see that work for for extended periods of time, too. Like you said, it wasn't just you don't just see it for like a second. There's scenes where it's like they kind of they focus on that stuff for, you know, for several minutes, which is which is great. Yeah, it, no, it is good. And, and I mean, it, it's hard to know when you're actually working on it um, that you know how, how it will be received and you know most of the time you're building stuff and it might be um you know they might add you oh you know nick will yell out to me oh they want him to stick his finger in his eye and i'm like how are we gonna do that <laughs> you know and then we're gonna work it out and then you oh, okay and you sort of oh yeah they're shooting that next week oh, okay and so it could be that thing and then you do it <laughs> Not that you're going, oh, I don't know how this is going to work. Like you do your best and you know how you're going to do it. But then you see it on 
on set or and you see the footage, you go, oh, wow, that really worked. Uh, yep. I, yeah. And as Beck said before, like we were there and we saw how the sequence evolved, but still in the cinema. And again, it's quite a unique uh, screen and an experience that it would mm-hmm. make us, it would startle us as well and make us cringe and, and really, um, yeah, how important it was to the sequence. It's, it is amazing that, you know, again, being in the industry for so long, but still not understanding how that could come together and work so well. I don't think maybe anyone knows in the end how uh, yeah. a project will come together, but this was really um, a great experience. Yeah. There's there's definitely an alchemy that, you know, it can either be good or bad and that happens when you, you know, you make a film and when it's released and, you know, sometimes the the timing could be... I mean, obviously, if it's a good film, it, you know, it's a good film, but... Yeah, it'll yeah, find it'll, its audience. Yeah, Can I ask it, a <laughs> What's Sorry. that? Yeah. What was that back? Can I ask a question? Yeah, um, of course. I was asked the other day if I... You know when you're on set sometimes and you can feel that it's going to be a good film? Like, you just know that it's going to be, you know, people out there are going to love it. I was like, for me, it was, it's different because um, I've been working on the boys' stuff for, I don't know, 10 years or something, all their YouTube stuff and all that. So for me, I was just terrified that to see them on a professional set because they're insane. Um, <laughs> but um, did, 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 did you guys feel like this is going to be a really amazing film like edit um, in the end or you just is it was it just um, another another horror film <laughs> it was for me it was another horror film but yeah um, yeah you you put a hundred percent and the thing mm. that made it fantastic is danny and michael and the team like that that crazy energy that you see from those guys in interviews that's there every day like 12 hours a day and no matter <laughs> how stressed or things not working exactly that that energy is there and maybe that translated yeah. into you know making the project you know next level i'm not sure but you, we yeah. didn't feel it was gonna be any different to any other of the great films we were on it was just mm. yeah it is an alchemy I, so the answer is no i, I didn't expect it to, <laughs> to be any different no. and i guess personally, I- i'm I'm on set. I'm sit like I'm. My focus is making everything work and work the best way it can, and making sure everything looks good. Whether mm. it's you know making sure the prosthetics are you know there's no edges lifting or the blood you know. So my fo- but I guess what I did like was it um yeah the, Michael and Danny's energy and and you know they're such lovely guys and we've worked with Aaron before the DP. Um, it was just a good vibe on the set in terms of everyone was really nice and everyone got on and there was no... Yeah. Everyone uh, wanted to do the best they could. Yeah, and, yeah. Um, you know, the the first day, you know, everyone was, even though it was, you know, we were chugging it and it was, we had to get it in, in a certain <laughs> set amount of time, there was no sort of feeling like, oh, you know, yeah. this is... Yeah, you yeah. weren't backed into a corner yeah. or anything like that. You were yeah. just... Yeah, yeah you, you just knew it was a good group of people that wanted to have fun and do a good thing and, and because you got that energy from the directors, you sort of, you know, you sort of you want to go into battle for them. And, yeah. And I don't think from, from a, a technician or a crew point of view, you can really take in how the film's going to come together. You know, you're on set and you're focusing on your job and, there's so many distractions, but again, you're focusing on your job. You can't really, you can't really feel that how everything is going to come together, basically. And yeah, I haven't felt that for 35 years. So yeah, um, yes. yeah. It, the filmmakers kind of bring it together, and then the, you know, the rest of the world kind of, you know, jumps on board. Or yeah, there is an alchemy, no, no doubt. Yeah, I was curious. Yeah. It's interesting that you brought that up, Beck, because I was actually going to like ask you guys, which you kind of you know went into it there, but where you had previously worked with these brothers before, and then you know you guys coming on 
and, you know, being part of this project, what kind of like, what were the differences, uh, you know, between like, what was your experience working with them on this particular project? Just like overall, where you've had that experience back, but, you know, first time working with these guys, right. For a Nick and Paul. Yes. Yes. And, and I remember when, uh, we got contacted and Nick's are, uh, we got asked to do this, the effects for the film, blah, blah, blah. Um, I said, oh, who are the directors? And he goes, oh, they've got this YouTube channel called Rack a Rack. And I'm like, oh. and he goes, have a look at it. <laughs> and I started, and I went home and I was like, look it up. And I'm going, okay, well, what is this? And then I sort of see some of the videos and then, the, you know, the wrestling and the smashing in the barbed wire and blue road shoes. And my, my first thought was, how are these guys not A, in prison or B, dead? <laughs> And then I came in the next day and said, oh, so, yeah. so these, these guys look like a lot of fun. And then when we, you know, we, we built everything in our first, I remember when we actually first met them because they were doing, I think, location scouting, we went down to Adelaide and we were showing them all the prosthetics and we were, oh, they're just, they sort of reminded us of, you know, us when we were like 15 years old, like little Fangorian sort of um <laughs> monster makers and um yeah i mean it would be obviously try and keep the enthusiasm but yeah they're just like little kids you know i mean when i started i was making super eight movies and you know back before digital you know i'm talking 45 years ago but yeah i did it was just cool that they were just really nice guys and um just normal you know and just had a passion for what they were doing and that's when it becomes sort of Fun. What about for I you, think- Beck? I was curious, yeah, with you, just where you've worked with these guys, you know, for so long and then making that transition and, and working with them on their major debut. What was that kind of experience like for you? Well, it was it was nice. <laughs> it's nice to be able to continue it with them. Um, I, yeah, knowing them for so long, I was worried at <laughs> like it was good for me because I had an understanding of how they worked and what to expect from them and that kind of stuff. But I just had no idea how they could transfer into a professional setting. <laughs> um, like I think the first day of work, Danny turned up without shoes on. So like, okay, this is just, it's just going to be normal. <laughs> this is yeah. going to be racka racka. Um, but I think talking about the energy so much, I think it's almost um, uh, like it's addictive being around them because, like, you know, doing all their YouTube stuff in their dad's backyard, running through their dad's walls and mixing dog food and fake blood together, which is the worst thing I've ever smelt in my life. But I would go back. I always go back. And sometimes I'd be driving down there and I'd be like, why am I, like, no money. I'd I'd get, like, maybe 100 bucks for some blood or something. Um, I was like, why am I, like, I've been doing this for 10 years now. (laughs) Why am I going back to this guy's house? (laughs) Um, But it is, I think, I think the energy is really addictive and they haven't changed from whenever I started working with them. They're still exactly the same. And it's it is really refreshing working with people like that. That um, um, I don't know. They just make you feel good about being around them. And I think also um, they this very aware of what they want. I think a lot of the time in the makeup department, um, especially when you do get male directors, they don't understand hair and makeup they don't they don't know the process of it and they don't know kind of what to do with it so a lot of the time you just get told I don't want to see it I don't want to I don't want to know it's there so um with these guys I think uh it's just really nice to have like even more direction than you would usually get like the chipped um nail polish on Mia was a huge thing for Danny like everything's so precise all the contact lenses where the blood's coming from um the backstory of everyone even um, I'm pretty sure they had like a bible of 
all the different spirits, like backstories to all the different spirits um, that turn up and or didn't turn up yet. Maybe maybe you talk to me too. Um, <laughs> but like they have, they put so much research into it that it's 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 really lovely working with people that just know exactly what they want. Which yeah, again in makeup, I don't think you get a lot of the time. Yeah, and I was just uh, as far as like the one uh, Beck, as far as the the Bible goes, that is something that I would like. Just saying, you know, being so interested in all the behind the scenes kind of stuff, that is something I would absolutely love to read someday if they ever made make that stuff like public, like down Same. the road. Because <laughs> that's <laughs> he told, I think they told me about it, but um, I've never seen it. I'd really love to see it. It's cool though that they had that, like you said, they they did that level of research. They were prepared, you know, had like a whole book based off all these different uh, spirits and their backstories. And you know, I know uh, Talk to Me Too just got recently announced, so I can't wait to see what they're going to to do with that. But you know, like you said, just obviously they're doing something right. If you know, if you kept wanting to come back uh, all these years and then you know work on this feature film with them as well, yeah, definitely, they're all right. <laughs> <laughs> so as far as um, I also wanted to talk to you guys about, you know, our, our lead character, you know, Mia, we've mentioned her, you know, a couple of times as well, but um, she, you know, Sophie Wilde, she was phenomenal in the film. Um, can you talk about coming up with her look as far as like, you know, the, the hair and makeup, um, but also later on in the movie, obviously what happens towards the end, like, you know, any of like the, the prosthetics and makeup that went into kind of that look at the end of the film too. And we'll start uh, with you, Beck. Yeah, um, I mean, the beginning of Mia, um, well, I, I guess story-wise she was sick at the beginning of the film um, and you can kind of tell she's a bit worn out and then she has her possession and the first time she gets possessed she's immediately better um, and then because that spirit stuck in her um as the film goes, there's a bit of possession makeup that comes out. Like every time she touches the hand, there's a bit more. Um, so she she had quite the journey. Um, but also with her and with all the other teen characters, we just wanted them to be relatable. We didn't want them to – we want them to kind of last the test of time as well, like so we can – watch the film in 20 years and not be jarred by um, like a scrunchie or, you know, like a 20, 22, 21, whenever we filmed it, um, <laughs> haircut. You know, we wanted them to be kind of timeless. Um, so in terms of hair and makeup, everyone just needed to be quite natural. Um, and uh, I guess the chip nails was also a thing. Um that was, I think, to show her mental health. Um, and Danny and Michael continuously focused on her kind of chipping her nails and scratching them um, to show kind of where she was in her mind, um, which was reasonably difficult for continuity. <laughs> <laughs> we got I there. Imagine. Yeah. <laughs> And then, yeah, I guess her car crash look um, was a bit of a mix between prosthetics and us. Um, she had a couple of bondos and then a, a silicon eye bulge. Um, and then actually that's a, the, her fingers in that last scene were CG. Um, oh, was there a bit of, there was a bit of, there were a couple of fingers on wires. Did we use that? I can't remember now. To, um, when the fingers are all broken, we tried yeah. to incorporate some um, physical um, broken fingers, but in the yeah. end it was, it was just shot. the way the shot was composed and everything, we weren't going to be able to get it into the Oh, the that's right, because it was yeah. that one shot, yeah. 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 One, long tracking shot and it was just yeah. quite difficult so they ended up just breaking them in um which was easier anyway just yeah to... yeah so another tiny bit of cg <laughs> but yeah she's 
again, just a lovely person to work with and great face. <laughs> yeah, no, she was phenomenal in, in the movie and and man, kind of going back to a little bit earlier when you we were talking about just like the editing, initially watching the film for the first time when we get to that scene where, you know, she's with Riley, wasn't sure if like if she because, like you know, you have her mom and saying like, oh, I'm proud of you. And so you think that she's going to throw Riley into the road. And when that scene, when it kind of cuts there for a second, that's initially what I thought had happened, that she had thrown him in there to get him you know, released from the spirits. And then you realize that, you know, she actually jumped into the road and got hit by the car. So that watching initially, I was like, wait, what's go what's going on? And then you kind of you see like or like you guys are talking about the broken fingers and everything like that. So I, the ending, I'd say one of my favorite endings for like a horror movie and like probably like recent memory as well, just with everything that kind of happened with that scene there. Mm. So so for you as a. A fresh audience member, did you think that she jumped or she was pushed by? Yeah, I thought um, initially that she, she had pushed uh Riley into the road. That's what I thought, just because that's what it was kind of leading up to, and where she had tried to you know kill him earlier to save him from the spirits. So I thought it was her just letting him go into the road. Um, and then obviously, like once you see her like on the ground get up, I'm like, oh, okay, that she had jumped, you know, into the road herself. Yeah, okay. I I always thought that, and again, I could be wrong, I always thought uh, Riley's um, sister um, kind of Shit. got involved in that moment. I'm, I'm not sure if that was, and Beck may, may know better, I'm, I wasn't sure if that was <laughs> how it was supposed to be. Um, um, yeah, I was trying to remember it. I took my family to see it and my brother-in-law was like, so what happened? Did she fall or she pushed? And I was like, yeah, she was pushed. And then I saw her again. I was like, no, I don't think she was. But then I read and I saw an interview with Danny and Michael because I was I couldn't remember either. Um, and they said it's up to audience interpretation. So I'm I'm believing that she she um, uh, yeah. threw herself off now. Yeah. Sacrifice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, always, I love when when films do that sometimes, too, and they leave it up to interpretation of the audience, just because then you can get so many different points mm. of view, you know, from the film, like we all kind of had, you know, different views of what happened, like initially, which is always a great me and my buddy yeah. after the movie, were talking about it for for quite a bit, you know, just especially with what happens at the, you know, the end of the film where she shows up and then she's on the other side of the hand, you know, when they they kind of like summon her. So, yeah. I'm going to go back to the script and read read it to see if it tells us. <laughs> <laughs> and what about for you guys, you know, just as far as, uh, you know, that that scene, like, particular, just as far as, like, prosthetics and, and stuff goes, was uh, besides, like, you know, you already mentioned the fingers, but was there anything else that... Um... Quain, do you know, Quain's completely covered in prosthetics. The, uh... yeah, you know, the old guy that was oh, yeah, in the yep, wheelchair. Yep. Yep. So that that was like fifty percent of our work on the film, uh, and it seems that that character has been diluted and and pulled out of the the storyline a bit. He he was in the script. He was the main demon. He was the one coercing everyone and and drawing Mia into the spirit world and trying to you know hold on to Riley. Yep. Uh, but as it appeared in the film, he was just part of the, when, when they see the hell sequence, he just appeared to be part of the, the demon horde. He wasn't, he wasn't given the time and he had a lot of dialogue with Mia. He, um, Maybe he was, that's in the sequel. No. Yeah, he was still <laughs> coercing her and influencing the mother and, um, and, yeah, he had some great dialogue and there was, you know, small moments between them. Even when he was in the wheelchair, he was still prompting her to, to push Riley onto the road. All that seems to have been pulled out, which is unfortunate for us. We'll, we'll probably make a, a behind-the-scenes making of that because that the actor, Kaz C Comerford, was wonderful. He was like an 80-year-old gentleman put through a, a six hour makeup full body seven hours six seven hours <laughs> wow. um, 
he, he was a trooper and he was wonderful to work with. And then, it, yeah, just to not see that on the screen and the effort we put in, that was the only downside for us. But, you know, again, it, the story worked wonderfully, but. I mean, yeah. what, what I, you I would love to see a director's cut for sure. I think that especially that hell sequence that you're talking about, that was, wasn't, I think that was two days of filming yeah. that got cut into about 10 seconds, which I think for me was disappointing as well. And we had all those spirit heads that we did and we had the yeah. guy that cut his face, there's a guy cutting his face yeah. up. and The baby um, eater. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, I mean, that they <laughs> might have held it, held it back for this sequel, who knows, but Cass or Quain, his, his whole head is completely covered in prosthetics. His whole body is covered in prosthetics, yeah. but you only yeah. get these tight yeah. shots of him and, um, yeah, he's clinging on to Riley and all around him there was all these deformed faces, all these demons that we put, again, a lot of time into, a lot of, I might bring one over and show you in a moment. Um, yeah. But, yeah, just that whole <laughs> sequence was... Uh, a little bit disappointing from a prosthetics point of view, and I, I felt still could have made the story um, stronger or still worked within the the parameters that the guys, um, you know, set up. Yeah, but, I'm sure they had a good reason. Yeah, and sure. it could it could be they were just giving you a little taste. Yeah, you know, as I say, yeah. Um, Even though it was like, and I totally understand coming from your guys' point of view, like to to see, especially if you worked on it for that long, to see it only in there for, for 10 seconds. But I will say those 10, 15 seconds or whatever that you do get to see kind of that that hellscape was really effective. Oh, yeah. that, that, is, that is creepy. Yeah. <laughs> so all of these heads we, we did for the, the spirit world, and and we've they featured like there's you know the camera roaming around and featuring and and we did about what did we do twenty of them or something? No, no uh, maybe ten, fifteen. <laughs> um, that, but that, 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 there's <laughs> hundreds. We did a hundred of them. No, <laughs> some really creepy shots where the cameras just sort of floating and these heads are coming in and out. Um, and, and back it, yeah, the, I, yeah, yeah. I think there was a lot of. Um, I think that was one scene that um, really creeped us out as well on set was when you see a bit of it in the film where um, Mia's pulled in to that kind of orgy of mm. naked spirits. Yeah. Um, but that that was terrifying, that scene, with, with all those kind of faces that are, as you were saying earlier, like they're realistic, they're kind of people have real deformities like that, but it's just that kind of second look like, oh, that's different. And the yeah. lighting was all red and everyone's covered in slime and um, just writhing around each other. It was, yeah, it was. A Pat, you probably wouldn't have noticed that, but it, it yeah. was like 30 or 40 people on set. Yeah. And it was unsettling. They were all naked. They were all covered in blood and yeah. goop. And, and and some of the actors were creepy as well, but um, that's a different yeah. story. <laughs> um, but we did base a lot of those spirits, as Beck was saying, on, on real, you know, like one of the guy, um, spirits was that um, the ageing disease. What's it called? Progeria or whatever it's called? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and then another one was like a, a, that guy that has tumours on his face. So we found all these references of of real afflictions and deformities and genetic, you know, ab aberrations rather than going monstery and creaturey. Now, um, I, you guys got me so excited. I definitely want to see, like, ho I'm hoping they do, like, a behind-the-scenes yeah. like, documentary as far as oh, this stuff goes. We are. We're putting yeah. it together now. Yeah, yeah. We, we've got Perfect. 50 hours of footage of everything we've made. We, we do it on every project. We just film everything. Excellent. Um, yeah. So, because but yeah, obviously they've got a good. Maybe they held it back just because it was like, you know, we'll give you a taste, but then we'll give you, you know, yeah, more of it down the down the line in the future, yeah. you know, potentially with with like a sequel or because I know I I saw like another interview with uh with Danny and that they were talking about um 
they had shot like a prequel sequence. So I don't know if maybe if they're going to go like a, a prequel route for the sequel, I guess, you know, we'll see once, once that comes to fruition. But uh, I wanted to mention that the, the two heads that you had just shown, were you inspired at all? Cause they, I don't know for me, it just reminded me a little bit of uh, the movie pumpkin head uh, from the eighties, the faces yeah. kind of had a, a, a similar to look to one of like pumpkin heads like faces was there any inspiration from that film there or just kind of no that as paul said they were uh we got it from real photos from real real people with those afflictions so there was those yeah those mm -hmm. deformities and those medical conditions and then we just um went from there yeah just went a little bit more fantastical and yeah it, yeah, and just put a smile on someone or a grin, and it, uh, yeah, it was creepy enough. Yeah, and I think it's Quain, that grin. Yeah, with Quain, if again, if I showed you the sculptures, he had a great face, but we sort of exaggerated his bones, even though he was sort of a an old, you know, he, a little bit gaunt. We we exaggerated his um, bone structure in his face, and if you if you looked at the sculpture from the profile. We sort of made him have um, hunchback. Yeah, like a hunchback. Um, what's the bird? What, what did I? Yeah, he's got like the hump on his back. But if you looked at him, oh, I can't think of a the hawk. animal. <laughs> no, it's not a hawk. It's Vulture. like um, a what? Vulture. <laughs> yeah, vulture. Yeah, it's like a vulture. There you go. A vulture <laughs> profile. Because again, he's completely. Complete silicon prosthetics from the from the shoulders up. So yeah, he has like a real vault hunched over vulture look. Um, but all his forehead and his and we exaggerated the bones in the back of his head and um, all the plates of the skull. So yeah, it, it it was a huge sculpt and a huge prosthetic deal. But it it was to augment and his face comes through the prosthetics. Um, but it, it, it was a really crit, and obviously with the lenses and and he's he had all wounds on him. Um, so I was getting to the point where there was a bit of Chernobyl tumory um, inspiration on his arms and legs and and um, yeah, the, and sort of um, welts and and with a bit of mucus and sort of um, again weeping. Yeah. Kaz, the, the actor, again, an 80-year-old gentleman and really funny. Uh, last night he put up a, a, a post on Facebook and you should probably try and um, put a link on your, on your podcast. But he gives an overview. He said, I went and saw a screening in one of his little country towns where he lives and a, and a lady died at the screening and they had to... Uh, get a nap. So he gives it, he always gives wonderful stories and he, you know, he's always smiling. He's always cheeky that, um, you know, he's pushing the story to the limits. And, and then he gets to the end, he goes, the only disappointing thing is that there was a guy in it and he was put through a six hour makeup and he's only in the film for 10 seconds. And then, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, again, yeah. it's a, a wonderful three minute overview of the film. And, and <laughs> <it's fine. laughs> Yeah, he had all these great stories, which you obviously should interview him for. But like he had this, like he, I'm trying to remember. One of them, he was, um, he was in love with. He, he was going out, or he had a relationship with some woman, and she was the daughter of a bookie, who he owed money to, or something. And you know, he had all these people. Like, he had all these weird stories like that. He had these people <laughs> after him, and then because the father of this woman liked him that he he got rid of the debt or something it was some yeah. like scary yeah, stories for, like this for six hours you're hearing stories like that <laughs> you and you connect, you connect with the the person by that time so yeah, yeah. You're yeah. spending very a lot of time with very colorful parts yeah, no, I definitely have to have you guys. Yeah, send uh, you know the link to like his page so that way you know can check that you know that stuff out. I mean, yeah, when you're you're spending that much time with someone. I'm sure you, you get to hear some, you know, some interesting, you know, stories about about you know each other. Like, not only I'm sure you guys were talking to him about different things as well, but yeah, I mean, I it's I hope at least yeah the behind the scenes stuff that we get to you know we get to see more of that because 
just seeing him in those, you know, those couple like scenes uh, w- again was was really effective. I mean, you guys, fantastic work. So, and maybe it's a situation where less is more, like you know, because we're so close to it and we want to shove it off, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Um, we're, we're like, oh, you know, do a big wide shot of him. You know, he's covered in makeup, and but when the I don't agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, no, 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 that, but then. You know, as you said, when the audience sees it, it's so much more effective than what we think is going to be effective. If that makes sense. Yeah, because you see him like a, as an audience member, you see him for those quick glimpses, and even even that that hellscape kind of sequence, you see that for a quick glimpse, and you, you kind of just start. You see things so fast that you know you see maybe a couple things, and you're, you're trying to put together in your mind, well, what else? Like yeah. we we only saw like this little bit, but what else could be in there? And you start coming up with all these, you know, crazy things, you know, in your head. So I I do agree, but I totally understand, like, on your side as well, that you want to see more of it, you know, too. So fingers crossed for uh, for the sequel. Yeah, and we're we're also looking at it from an artistic and technical standpoint. Like, we're sort of going, yeah, that's a guy there and he's got, you know, 1.5 kilograms of silicon pieces on his head and, you yeah. know, and you know, we we colour them. Three hundred bucks for those contacts. We want to see them. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's all there's a lot of technicalities that we're is, sort of fills our mind up rather than the and and we don't get that first audience reaction because we've been looking at it for eight weeks. Yeah. From 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 a ball of clay to like running the pieces in the molds and and you, you get very de- detached from it in terms of seeing the final it was probably like an artist doing a painting yeah you know he he won't have the effect that someone sees it for the first time would have that makes sense which um for for all you guys and we'll start with you beck as far as because i mean so many you know different looks you know designs in the film and i feel like it might have an idea for for you guys but we'll start with you beck like what what look, and I'm sure you're proud of all of these, but what look were you are you most proud of how it ended up turning out and seeing it on the film um out of like all your di- the different looks and designs? Um, I mean, f- oh, uh, <laughs> hard. <laughs> well, I really love the transition the transition of um Rhea, Mia's mum um from beautiful Rhea turning into the the drowned woman. The old man, I think, her character was. I can't remember. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that, and that tied in with the sound design of the water. I think um, okay. that whole kind of, that character journey of you, kind of, the audience realising that that isn't, that isn't her mum. These are the spirits just tagging her along. Um and then I think it, I think she's pretty normal. And then I think she has. I think there was maybe about four different stages of her, where she's yeah, normal, lovely Mia's mum. And then she has the dead contact lenses, um, with a bit of like a mottly dead makeup that's in the same kind of color tones as the omen and then she started getting prosthetics put on her and then that last scene um with the wheelchair at the road she's like almost full omen and wet and gloopy and drowned and swollen and I I I don't know watching that back I think that's a really impressive um I don't know, character journey, I suppose. And on top of it, with the sound design, just just tease it off. It's re- really great. <laughs> oh, yeah, the 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 water of the the sound, like the gurgling yeah. and stuff, it, it was great. But, yeah, like her transition, I love that. And speaking of, we'll jump, you know, into your guys' favorite in a second, but I just where you mentioned that, um, as far as that character goes, that was another point of, where me and my buddy that once we had saw the film, we were wondering, you know, was, so was that Mia's mom? Like, was she trying to help her? Cause where at one point she's like, Oh, like he's in trouble. We were kind of going back and forth. Like if that was the case or if that was, you know, just was like a demon, like messing with her. 
because there is like that that one point where she's like, oh, like, yeah, Riley needs help. Like, go, you know, go help him out. Um, so it's like, oh, it seems like she's trying to help him. But then not so much, you know, in other scenes. So we were both kind of torn on where that fell. But it sounds like you guys are both or you're like, nope, that wasn't the case. Yeah, she was I, I, I think you're right. I think there was moments. And I again, I could be wrong, but for interpretation, I, I thought there was moments where she was trying to guide and help her. But I don't. Th- I think she was struggling, and and the the demonic side was taking over all the time. But um, I, I felt you could interpret it that I, way as well. I saw her as like a re- recruiting officer for bringing people into hell. That's how I. <laughs> put it. So, I think every time I watched, uh, even though we've read the script, it's been long enough to forget everything. So I think every time I've watched it, um, I've had a different view of it as well same with the ending with Mia falling or being thrown off my my views changed every time I've watched it and to me that's one of the the things that makes a great film when you can go back watch it multiple times and you can pick up on on little things every time that you watch the film that you you hadn't you know the previous time that you had watched it and I think that this is a good example of of one of those you know type of films with just so many different interpretations what about for you guys? I have a feeling, was it the kind of the look we were just talking about or was there another uh, particular look or design for a character that you really were proud of? Well, I think it was going to be Quain yeah. and that whole sequence with all the demonic masks and that, yeah, it was a lot of our work. But in the film, I think the most impactful sequence was the Riley possession and the smashing of the head and then, the ladder sequence, and the where, eye. yeah, the eye. I, I, Everything related to to Riley was worked so well, and probably would be a standout for us. And I really liked that a because of how it affected the audience. But when he did smash his head, and then the camera was looking down on him, he lifted his head up, and he's looking up at like that, and all the blood went down his face. Because what? Because he's got all these rigs in his hair, like very carefully um, made blood tubing that is hidden through, all through his hair. And he's got all the, So to the audience, they're probably going, oh, they probably just threw a bit of blood on his head. But he's actually got, he's got tubes down the back of his head and there's all these select points coming through here where we've made the... So it's quite elaborate, but it just looks like he's bleeding. Yeah. That makes sense. It, it, it looks like we didn't do anything, but it's actually quite... Elaborate underneath the... That's the best makeups, don't you think? Yeah. Or the best effects is when it looks like you've done nothing. Yeah. <laughs> there's, there's quite a bit behind the curtain, so to speak. Yeah, exactly. I was exactly what you said uh, back there, just that when you can't tell, when it doesn't look like there's much done, but then you find out that there was all these rigs and everything, like you guys were saying, mm. it just shows how great of a job, you know, you guys did as far as like that goes. Um, mm-hmm. One of the things I think interesting so there's been you know with uh possession films i mean there's been or or demonic you know movies there's been a number of them you know over the years everything like from you know the exorcist back in the 70s we've definitely gotten like the conjuring and stuff like that more recent like memories um where there's been so many done what's your approach to something like that where you want you know, the work to stand out, but there's so many different examples already done of that particular, you know, style of makeup or, or or prosthetic look. Like, how do you approach something like that where you want yours, you want to make sure that yours stands out from the rest? Great, great question. Um, good question. Grounded in reality a bit more, maybe? Because I know The Conjuring, it was all very, um, speaking of The Conjuring, it was already stylized, wasn't it? Almost like, painted designs on people's faces, weren't they, from memory? You know, like these sort of red, it was almost like kabuki Japanese or something. Yeah, so it's um, been, since I've seen the original film, the original Conjuring, it's been a little bit yeah. since I've seen it. So I can't, like the top of my head, I don't, I don't, you know, like quite remember, but. Yeah, and they're very, I think we just tried to make it, as we said, we went more of a forensic dead mm. people, you know, different, um, things that can happen to you, to your body, whether it's 
you know, after you've been drowned or, you know, you like the thing I forgot to say about Quain was with the, the welts and everything, again, we'll sort of, that was like a radiation sort of a, a feel because, you know, hell burning, you know, it's all, yep. you know, so we um, as well as him with his look, we had that he's been afflicted by, um, you know, bad stuff in hell, so to speak, you know, which has affected his skin. So we try and sort of come up with a, you know, a reason or a backstory to, so it sort of makes a bit of, you know, it follows the rules of what it's meant, even though it's supernatural and it's spirit based, it's, you know, trying to follow the rules of that world. Because they've all, they've all died. Like they've all, um, all the spirits have died in a natural way. Like that woman drowned. Yeah. Um, like the first guy you see who's just an old man, <laughs> um, you know, Mia gets hit by a car. So they're all, they all die nat- naturally or, you know, they get murdered or something. So they're, they're spirits but they're not. Yeah, fantastical beings per se. Um, yeah, yeah, and I think it's a great question, Pat. And um, again, I don't think we're doing anything unique. And you know, I think that the story. Yes, we are. And, well, no, I, I think the story and the, and the drama and <laughs> yeah, no, the, the way it's all put together that that carries you and and creates creates a uniqueness to what you're doing. Like people have put blood tubes in hair before, but yeah. Again, you do it you do it well. You do it to to work with the story and 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 it it picks up its own tone and and uniqueness when when it's all brought together. But yeah. You've got to you've got to make it work within the context of the the film and the style of the film. Like if we went I remember early on we started doing Quain designs and we went a bit more, I'm not going to say creaturey, but more, maybe a bit more deformed, if I'm allowed to say that. And and it wasn't what they wanted, and it, rightly so. It, just, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't that movie, if that makes sense. And it's like in the spirit world, if we had, you know, like Pan's Labyrinth stuff coming out, again, it's not that movie. Yeah, um, it, it, it would have been cool, but everyone would be going, "Well, why is there these weird?" Fantastic yeah, where did this come from? Yeah, so um, that has, I guess, you have to be in line with the the texture and the the concept of the movie. What yeah. were you I saying? I guess back. I think with the like the possession <clears throat> makeups and world where the kids are getting possessed, it's still like um still real because the story behind it it's like a metaphor for drug use Mm -hmm. like you um the kids are using it to get off and when their parents aren't around and they're using it as a high um so i think you you kind of want to be shocked a little bit by what they're doing but Again, I don't. I don't think we're we're trying to make it this scary, terrifying horror film in that sense. Like that. That's a kind of more of a drama film in those scenes than yeah. horror in, in some ways. Until Riley starts smashing his head, but um, uh, I think you 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 still want to be concerned for the kids and. What are they doing? They're ruining their lives. They're taking drugs. You know that kind of that kind of thing. So I think I think everything comes from um, real real life. I suppose the spirits. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I like everything. that approach to it. Uh, that like different approach to it. Um, and, uh, the especially the like the tonal shift where, like you said, uh, back there they're partying. You know, they're having fun. You know, just being at this party, being around all these different people. And you kind of see those scenes even where like the demons are kind of like they're they're possessed initially. And um, like at one point, uh, Mia like starts talking. I, I don't know if that was because I, I don't know it personally myself, if that was like French or something that she was like singing in the film at one point. I know she's yeah, like, you, like you just, yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, she was. So yeah. like, you're kind of having fun there for a second. And then all of a sudden you just get that tonal shift where Riley gets possessed. You know, the, the mom starts talking and then all hell kind of like breaks loose there. So you're, yeah. you you feel like kind of like loose there sitting in the theater as an audience member. And then all of a sudden it gets crazy, like real quick in, in that one scene. Yeah. Which is, I guess, a, tri- you know, a real tribute to the, the boys, because I know, as I was saying before, when Riley started being me as like speaking as her mum and talking to her, and then he starts smashing it like that change. And that mm. moment, just people just went, "Whoa!" <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Uh, being, I remember being there that opening night and and kind of seeing some of the people around us. And there was someone that was sitting next to me that wasn't like you know with our group, and you saw them jump like at that moment. So it's always kind of funny to to see people, you know, when you go to like these horror movies and just see that you know reaction as an audience member. But for you guys, you know, especially when you go to see some of these screenings too, I'm sure that's even um, you know, it means even more to you because it knows that, you know, your work uh, is really hitting like how it's supposed to. Yeah. It, it's it's like those moments in where you know something's about to happen and your heart starts racing. Yep. Yeah. And then something really bad happens and you just, in, in that moment, like a the foot. Yeah. The foot's a great <laughs> scene. Yeah. <laughs> the foot sucking. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that... I think I've gotten um, more comments on that than anything else. To be yeah, fair. what what was going that on? That was a fake fake leg as well. Yeah, <laughs> that was a fake silicon foot. Yeah. So, so you... also, um, Beck, remember we did the sand the sad man. What happened to him? Oh yeah, sad man. So again, there was a few characters that were a few yeah. demons that pop in just to to taunt her and um guide her into the, the spirit world and whisper to her a couple of those well, even moments. that scene with the little girl was a huge scene she took yeah. her through the whole um hospital and every, yeah yeah there is a lot cut out <laughs> oh man man like the, the more <laughs> that you guys are telling telling me i'm just like oh definitely i want to see you know all these these cut scenes um you know i i hope that we get it seems like nowadays we uh, there seems to be a good amount of like director's cuts, you know, release. I hope once yeah. this does, you know, come out on a you know Blu-ray 4K, hopefully we get some nice, uh, even if it's not like all put together, even just like the deleted scenes, just as kind of like a separate feature. It'd be great to you know to see some of this stuff. Yeah, and Pat, you haven't asked us about the other big moment at the beginning of the film we did. The Which kangaroo. one? Oh, the kangaroo! Yeah. Uh- Yep. Yeah, we did an animatronic kangaroo. That was okay. Yeah, because I was wondering, yeah. I was like, you know, watching, you know, the, the initial when they come across the kangaroo, I was like, not a, it's not a real, you know, kangaroo that's like obviously like sitting there. So that was an animatronic. Yeah, it was a puppet we built. And um, yeah, we puppeteered it on, you know, we had rods and cables. And that, again, another good use of um, VFX where, we had rods connected to the head and the paw and everything, and then they just paint them out. Was there any, uh, and I don't know if you guys would like know, was there any additional scenes with that kangaroo? Because I know later on in the film, we see the kangaroo like outside of the, kangaroo, yeah. the hospital the, room. In the hospital, yeah. But, but was there was anything real- else that you remember? Was it just those two scenes? No, I think that was intact. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think there might have been a, in the hospital, I think the kangaroo might have, or maybe in the script, we might have never shot it. I think the kangaroo was meant to take her out of the room at least. Okay. You're that, right. That there was. But I feel like we didn't even shoot that. I'm not sure. I, don't I know just know that. Is. Yeah, sorry. Oh, I was just to say, I don't know what it is, what it was about, like, the kangaroo, but I just remember seeing, like, the initial trailer for the film and seeing... Because uh, in the trailer, I believe you see uh, the kangaroo like outside the hospital room, and then you see some blood. Like it's like, a really quick shot in the trailer, but mm. I just remember watching that, and and for some reason, because kangaroos aren't naturally, I think, like creepy animals, 
But in the context of that trailer, I seeing that that quick clip and I'm like, I don't know why, but I mean, obviously there was like a little bit of blood there, but it's like there's going to be something really creepy with this kangaroo in the <laughs> film. And, and we saw, it, you know, for those two scenes and it, it, it definitely I mean, it was sad, um, but it something with animals, another film like for me, like growing up that uh, really creeped me out as I probably saw it when I was too young as a kid. But uh, Pet Cemetery, the original Pet yeah. Cemetery something about like dead animals i don't know has just always been in, in the way that they come back in the film that's just always really creeped me yeah. out um and so i, I think maybe it kind of ties into that where it's just like oh no are we gonna see like this really deranged kind of looking like kangaroo like later on in the film or something like that so i was i was kind of bracing myself for that to possibly happen at some point well we could have but again it might it might have been a different movie yeah <laughs> yeah exactly um, but um yeah i mean so it, it, it has been you know wonderful uh talking to you guys you know just i mean getting to hear all these kind of behind the scenes secrets getting to hear more about your work again i know i said it a couple times like here in the interview the your all your guys work fantastic should be very proud with how you know the final product came out and i can't wait to see more of the behind the scenes stuff is there anything else that you guys wanted to say just to kind of wrap things up about just your experience, you know, overall working on the movie. And uh, we'll start with you, Beck. Um, I don't know. I think it's just, it's been definitely been a whirlwind watching it out there in the world and seeing the boys from afar, um, <laughs> you know, going from festival to festival to, um you know, ce celebrate what a whole group of people did. Um, but also, in, in a way, for me, it's a it's pretty special seeing them. You know, who I have been doing tiny little unpaid things with for a long time. It's it's really special seeing them succeed because they are the as as insane as they are. They are also very talented, and they. They absolutely deserve all the praise that they're getting. They're they're um, talented guys, um, but yeah, it's just it's really nuts being a part of something that's um, and like Big Ball by A twenty four is huge. I love A twenty four, so being a part of something that um, you know so many people are seeing and yeah, it's it's quite overwhelming. But yeah, just oh, riding the wave. <laughs> And what about for you guys? Well, the, the good the good thing was, again when I first met them and saw how crazy they were and passionate and everything. When I was starting out, I had friends that I used to make little movies with, and but we used to do similar insane things where we'd we'd build a dummy and we'd run it over, you know, in the middle of suburbia out west, western Sydney or something. Or I had a a friend that had a shotgun and we made a dummy and blew its head off with a shotgun. I mean, obviously you couldn't do any of this now. But it sort of reminded me of, oh, yeah, I was sort of, I mean, I wasn't as overt as and um, confident as, as those guys, but um, it, it was a way of expressing myself and getting into makeup effects and that. But, yeah, obviously to see them, um, I mean, sorry, my point I was going to make was when I was doing that, they probably weren't even born. <laughs> so it's sort of like you meet these kids and so I'm happy that I could bring my, experience and help with their vision and you know all the stuff that we've done you know and advise them and so well this is what we can bring to the table because we've done this this and this and this and you know have they they appreciate that and, and it helps their vision and they can just ring us up and go oh you know we want to do this yeah we can do that so <laughs> <laughs> that's always fun yeah but, i i agree i i think we all we're all on the same page. We we did some great work and it and the film zoom really well, but I think just the energy of um Danny and Michael and and the and the community of the whole production and has kind of continued on even after the film is finished. You you continue to talk to the everyone and you still feel that that energy and that experience like continuing on, which you don't usually get with every film usually it just ends you just see the film released and um 
and you kind of move on to the next one, but you, you feel that something's going to grow from the, uh, this first experience and it's, you know, it's going to be positive. So, yeah. and, it, and it's funny because we work with a lot of similar, whether we work different parts of Australia or around the world, but when we post stuff on Instagram, it's, you know, people that we've done, you know, stunties that have been on the last job we did, you know, they'll comment on something or the DP, you know, like Aaron, who we did Mr. In Between with and other shows with all these similar people that we've worked with over the years will, you know, post a comment. And and with this one, it's been interesting because they're like, oh, the guys have got a hit um, mm. in terms of, you know, and we're like, wow, you know, Danny and Michael, have got, they've got a hit on their hands sort of thing. So, so that's always always a good thing because as we said like every job you do you try and do your best and you know well, you never you know what's going to happen yeah i mean and if it gets you know when we heard oh yeah it's it's, it's going to get a worldwide release we're like wow you know that's <laughs> that's huge especially from the strain aussie independent cinema to be seen yeah <laughs> yeah no i mean it just you, I think, and you guys might be like kind of like aware of this already, but I mean, the horror community, the horror fans are, I would say, probably some of the most passionate, dedicated fans. So, I mean, the film's had uh, some, you know, it's doing really well box office wise, and it's had some some nice legs. Um, so, I think it's just going to be one of those movies that, you know, it has like the initial release where it's out in theaters, but then you'll also, I think, get a little bit more once it hits like streaming and once it hits like the, the physical release as well. And it's just one of those movies that, you know, new people are going to be constantly discovering. Um, I, I think it's one of those films that will definitely stand the test of time and people are going to want to, you know, revisit, um, you know, over and over again, especially when you we're getting close, you know, over here in the States, we're getting close to the uh, the fall season or spooky season, as I like to call it. So this will definitely be one of those that it's going to be added to the uh, the rotation where you want to watch it like every single year. And I am so excited because uh, I saw that A24, it sounds like they are officially releasing uh, models or like molds of the hands for people to oh. be able to buy. Uh, so, <laughs> which in a way I was like, do like after seeing the movie, I was like, <laughs> would I want to own something like that and keep it in my house? But the being the big horror fan that I am, I, I definitely would want to have something like that. So. I, I can't wait for them to officially post that and uh, you know put it up for sale. Maybe we should do a Quain. We we'll do a Quain Pez dispenser. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that that would be. Good. I mean, there's, you know, like I already mentioned, to you guys they have like the the clothing, um, which yeah, a number of your guys' work is is featured on uh, the the clothing. So if you haven't had a chance to see that, I think that you you'll really you know dig those pieces. I, I want to say all of that is sold out last time I like, I looked, I believe wow. and I got a, um, I got a really nice print that I can actually, I, I don't know if you guys have had a chance to see it for the poster. Um, but I'll, sh I'll show you guys like in a second, but as soon as I saw that go up on the site, it was like instant purchase, you know, for me, I'm a big fan of like poster art and stuff like that for, for films. So, but yeah, just again, thank you guys so much for, for taking time out of, you know, all yeah, your schedules. Yeah. For you know, for coming we'll on you, here. Oh, sorry. We'll keep in touch, and we'll send you all the links to our behind-the-scenes stuff. Perfect. Yes. No, I I can't wait to check that all out. Yeah, and we'll we'll start putting stuff on our Instagram and page and everything. And awesome. YouTube yeah. Channel. So I'll give you guys, you know, give you guys a follow. So you guys, everyone's on uh, Instagram. It sounds like. Yes. Yeah, I don't post anything. <laughs> That's, I'm gonna try and get better. <laughs> that's okay. So, uh, interesting with this film. This is probably the first film in. I'm gonna say thirty that we've. Ha I've had a couple of because I I run Nick does our Facebook page and I do our Instagram. Um, even though it's got both our names on it, but I've had a few comments on some of the posts for talk to me, and I've gone. I think I went to school with that person, and it'd be like, oh. Congrats, Paul. I saw the movie last night, you know, and, you know, a few, the few people that I know of that I went to school with that knew that I was doing mm. weird makeup and stuff in high school. But that, I'm like, wow, that, that's someone I went to high school saw the film and saw my <laughs> the credit. Well, uh, that's pretty cool. <laughs> that, is, that is really cool. Yeah, I mean. It's pretty weird seeing so many people 
to see a horror film. Like even my mum's going to see it <laughs> for the second time. She hates horror films. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> seeing that, so like, many, hearing yeah. so many people go to see horror. Oh, yeah. I mean, at least like I know here it, it's interesting because I feel like, especially like the past several years, I feel like horror, like, I mean, they some of the films might not necessarily make like some of the, the huge box office, like, you know, for example, like Barbie, where it's like over like, you know, a billion dollars. But a lot of times these horror films, you know, they have a smaller budget and then some of the money that they do end up, you know, end up grossing by the time that they're done in the theater, like. Uh, last year we had Smile that I know made like an insane amount, you know, of money as far as like compared to like the budget, uh, what the budget was. Um, and but I mean, like I know Talk to Me has already, you know, made more than what it, you know, which I believe like a couple times of like what its budget is. So horror, I feel like, has been one of the most consistent genres at least like the past like several years. As far as if you make a good horror film, the people, the fans, they're gonna go out and see it and support it and. And oftentimes, you know, tell tell their friends, come back again, seeing it, you know, another time. So especially, um, you know, when it's a good one and people just like have fun. Well, horror, horror, sci-fi and fantasy always drive the industry, right? even in secondary markets to, to Blu-rays, to toys, to collectibles, to comic cons. You know, it's always been consistent and, and you know, a film or a project might, you know, pop up and really take the limelight for a while. But that 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 history has always been there for for genre films. Oh yeah, for sure. And I mean, I was just gonna... oh sorry. No, no, like you know, things like Halloween, like in terms of budget versus return, and Blair Witch Project, those huge, you know, where they spend a million bucks on it, mate. Like that, that's all mainly down to horror films. Yep. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of time it's it's word of mouth and I think I think that kind of happened, you know, with with like talk to me as well just people like getting that release and I mean it's had great ratings like on Rotten Tomatoes. I I know the last time I looked I believe like both were like in the 90s, um, you know, which is is nice. great to, to see. Yeah, like the scores are, you know, insane as far as like the reviews go. Um, so it, it's just one of those genres. I mean, it's my favorite genre of films. Um, but yeah, you guys you guys are, you know, thank you again for coming on here. You're welcome back to to come on, you know, anytime in the future for any future projects. And um, yeah, it, it was just, it was great talking to you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll keep in touch.